Hello, I'm Jess Crivera with your latest news break in Utah. A climber in the Little Cottonwood Canyon area was rescued from certain death after a rock the size of a refrigerator rolled onto him. The climber was with another climber who had the same thing happen to him, but luckily he was able to get out from under it. In Houston, Texas, a video of a tiger on the loose can be seen all over the internet. A sheriff can be heard yelling at the tiger's owner after coming face to face with a large animal. Texas is known for being one of the most lenient states to own exotic animals. And off the coast of California, two college students were rescued after they could not make it back to shore in their makeshift boat, which was made out of buckets, duct tape, and kiddie pools. And that's your latest news break. Now back to America's Voice Live. Seems we might need to get Carol Baskin down to Houston and get that cat under control. <laughs> Uh, in other news, in the wake of the shooting in Times Square in New York City that left three people in the hospital, including a four-year-old girl, Democrats predictably pushing for gun control across the nation. But there could be a bigger issue at play here, bail reform. That's right. We'll be talking about this with our panel today. Joining us now is radio host and Democrat strategist Robert Patello former Ohio congressman and author of the GOP's Lost Decade, Jim Renacci and president of the New York Young Republican Club, Gavin Wax. All right, earlier in this year in New York, a man was arrested and charged with three hate crimes after allegedly trying to shove an, or yes, trying to shove an Asian undercover cop onto the subway tracks. He was released this past Sunday without bail. The judge said his hands were tied because of the state's bail reform laws. Now, this similar situation over the weekend where we had this happen in Times Square, this is also really what we would consider a career criminal. This guy had just been arrested for assault in March. Gavin, I want to go to you. You live in New York. What do you think about this? Is, is the, are the bail reform laws too lenient there in New York City? Oh, absolutely. They're too lenient. Uh, as soon as they were passed, and they were one of the first uh, legislative actions to be passed when the Democrats took control of uh, the state legislature, uh, they're already trying to walk it back, and they're already trying to make up excuses for what this law has done. It's completely wrecked uh, law enforcement across the state, from the city to the suburbs to rural areas. We're seeing career criminals with rap sheets going back decades, uh, getting out on desk appearance tickets within a few hours, and going on to commit more crimes, and there's no disincentive uh, to change their behavior because they know that they're not going to actually pay or have any consequences uh, for their actions. What we really need is not all this bail reform. We need some victims' rights reform. We need laws on the books to protect victims and potential victims of all these criminals who are just roaming our streets and, and committing violence against innocent people. And we need to get real. This is, uh, this is about good governance. This shouldn't be a partisan issue in, in the slightest. You know, Robert, I want to come to you because a lot of these bail reform measures focus on nonviolent crimes as well. But quality of life crimes matter. I think they matter to a lot of people. If you're an elderly person and you're in one of these neighborhoods where all of a sudden they're not prosecuting these crimes or they're just letting people go in and out of jail with no bail, things like defecating on the street corner, uh, selling drugs, uh, soliciting prostitution, uh, these are all quality of life crimes. Nobody wants this on their corner, and some of these folks... They don't have the opportunity to find a, a new place to live. This is where they live. It's their neighborhood. Many of them have been there for years. How do you justify saying, well, it's all right. We'll just let them out and back and out and back. And, and it's mind blowing to me. How do you justify this? Oh, well, one, I think you're conflating the criminal legal system and the bail process with the uh, criminal justice system and the imprisonment process. I'm on the uh, board of directors for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and one of the things that we focus on is the fact that the cash bail system is, uh, is inordinately placing a burden upon poor people. We're making homelessness a crime. We're making poverty a crime. We're making the lack of access to resources a crime in America. We're creating a, a subclass of citizens in this country who are simply kept in holding cells, who are sometimes as many as 1,000 or 1,500 days awaiting so much as a hearing before even having a trial. If the issue of getting these cases to trial quicker, then we need to be clearing up the criminal justice system by ameliorating many of the uh, lower nonviolent uh, nonviolent crimes which are clogging up the system so we can ensure that we're getting the violent felons off the street. Also, we have to look at what we create crimes of in this country and how we can uh, get more people out of the criminal justice system so we can spend more time concentrating on, as you said, many of those quality of life crimes. If 
if you have an issue with people defecating, maybe we should create more public restrooms. Uh, if you have an issue with people who have vagrancy in your community, <laughs> then maybe we should be working on ensuring that people have more housing instead of housing them in prisons. That's a very medieval right. way of thinking. It's a very star chamber way of looking at uh, criminal justice reform. So we need to have a 21st century view of how we address mm -hmm. the uh, deal with people in our country. Mm -hmm. Jim, I want to go to you. I want to talk about this more because when we look at, uh, Robert has a point. We have a lot of people in jails that don't necessarily need to be in jail for what the crime is that they committed. Maybe it's a misdemeanor. Maybe it's not something as serious as keeping them in prison. How do we balance this? Because it seems like we have a lot of violent offenders that are getting out while we're keeping the nonviolent offenders in. How do we manage that? Well, look, I, I've been on with Robert before, and I agree in many instances what Robert's saying, and all, but I also agree with what Gavin's saying. We cannot just be allowing individuals back out on the street, and we do have to have some reforms, but the reform shouldn't be putting the burden on good citizens and good citizenship, and that's always the issue. So we do need reforms in our prison system, but we don't need reforms in our bail system, which allows people back out on the street they can do many of these things. I'm not sure the answer is money though. I mean, Robert talks about maybe money for housing and maybe money. Look, we are spending way too much money right now. I think in the end, we have to have good laws, tight laws. We have to enforce our laws. And at the same time, we have to have opportunities and we gotta get people back to work. So there's a lot of pieces to this, but the real piece would never be just to open, you know, to have such reforms with our bail system that we're putting people back out uh, on the street that are really mm -hmm. Uh, concerns for the citizen of the uh, state or the country. Well, I'm quite convinced the public restrooms are the answer. Uh, Robert convinced me of that. So we'll, we'll look into the public restroom solution. Um, uh, let's shift gears a little bit, if we could. Uh, today, the Senate Rules Committee held a hearing to advance the election overhaul legislation, uh, H.R. 1 and S. 1. Democrats say the sweeping election reform bill is necessary to safeguard our voting rights, which are under attack, they claim. Republicans are calling it a power grab. Uh, I'll start with you, Gavin. It seems to me that in Georgia, what they did got demonized, even though they're providing more drop boxes, uh, standardized hours, more early voting available for all 159 counties in Georgia. And yet everybody ran around saying, oh, they're, they're stifling um, voting. They're, they're disenfranchising people. People of color can't get IDs and all of this nonsense that doesn't even begin to make sense. The fact of the matter is they extended hours made more weekends available, made voting easier for people, not harder. What gives? Well, it just shows that this is not about principles. This is just about power grabs. It's very shameless. Uh, you can look at the laws here in New York. They're a lot stricter uh, than they are in Georgia, but there's no boycotts against the state of New York or many other Democrat states for that matter. Uh, Georgia passes a pretty straightforward uh, bill in terms of elect electoral reform that includes some very common sense provisions that's supported by the vast majority of Americans, whether it's ID requirements or otherwise, and they're demonized as the new Jim Crow. Uh, and it just shows now what you're seeing at the federal level, they're trying to just federalize all elections. So states have no rights uh, in, in these matters anymore if this was to pa if HR1 was to pass. It would federalize elections. It would create a, a complete mess and it's completely unconstitutional. And they're basically trying to codify uh, many of these haphazard changes that were made over the last year to our election process uh, in the wake of COVID. They're trying to codify that at the federal level uh, when there's been tons of grievances against these changes. There's been many issues against these changes to the processes. And uh, it's just being rammed through uh, as a power grab. And that's that's how we have to view it. It's, it's shameless. Uh, it's completely hypocritical. And their messaging uh, for red states is completely different on their messaging on blue states. Robert, I want to go to you. Both Steve and Gavin brought up voter ID. This has been a major bone of contention between the parties. Democrats saying voter ID is too hard to require because it's too hard to obtain. A lot of people in the media have done interviews with folks who say, we have IDs. Why is that an issue for Democrats? Well, uh, let's look at Georgia, for example, since I was brought up and since I've been working in voting rights in Georgia for 25 years. For 130 years, from 1872 until the year 2002, there was not a single Republican governor of the state of Georgia. Georgia passed a voter ID law in, in 1997. Since that law was put into effect in 2002, every single governor of Georgia has been a Republican. In 2005, Georgia passed a poll tax under the guise of a voter ID law that was struck down by the federal courts. At the time, five of the statewide 
white elected officials in Georgia were African or were either African American or Democratic, uh, many getting as much as seventy percent of the vote. After that law was uh, was reformed and put into place in twenty ten, you did not have another Democrat elected statewide for eleven years until Raphael Warnock and uh, John Ossoff in January of this year. The point is that Donald Trump gave a marching order to the state of Georgia, saying, "I need you to find me twelve thousand votes in order for me to win this election," and that's why they changed this law. That comes down to a grand total of eighty votes per county for 159 counties in Georgia that need to be uh, changed or uh, or making more difficult for people to vote in order to overturn the election, to change the composition of the United States Senate, to maintain a demographic uh, a majority on the state house, Senate, and the governor's mansion, all statewide officials for the Republican Party. Indeed, Georgia is a state that's 35 percent African American, 16 percent uh, Latino, 6 percent Asian, 54 percent women, yet they have a constitutional majority for one party in the entire legislature. We know that this is because of voter suppression. So every time Republicans try to argue that it is not and try to compare it to other states, you have to look at the text of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which laid out 16 specific jurisdictions that required strict uh, strict scrutiny and preclearance by the Justice Department, which was struck down by Shelby B. Holder in 2014. So what the HR 1 is trying to do is restore that oversight to prevent voter suppression laws from going into place that will prevent the democratic process from uh, ruling America's elections. Because Republicans fundamentally have not won a national, uh, the popular vote in any election in 17 years. And indeed, in the last 30 years, since George H.W. Bush, we've seen a grand total of one Republican win the popular vote in presidential election. The 50 Republican senators represent 40 million, 41 million fewer voters than the 50 uh, Democratic senators in the Senate. So what Democrats are trying to do is restore the democratic process to America. So what Democrats are trying to do is rig the system and, and change the rules of the game part way through. You know, in Connecticut, deep blue Connecticut, there is no uh, zero excuse absentee voting. There is no early voting. In Delaware, you can only early vote if you have an absentee ballot, but you can't get a no excuse absentee ballot. In Delaware, the president's home state, you look at these blue states, uh, Jim, and I will tell you that the voting is much more difficult in many of these Democrat-controlled states. And what's being said about Georgia is complete hogwash, frankly, uh, but they must be proud of all of those Democrat governors enforcing Jim Crow laws and all of the other things they did in Georgia for a number of decades until Republicans finally came along to deliver some freedom. Your thoughts? Well, first off, let's look, let's look at state by state, and I think that's the most important thing. St there are states that are doing a really good job. There are states that are not doing a good job. Let's look at the comparison, but let's not have the federal overreach and the Democrats in the federal government taking over the election system. But let's look at what states work. Here in Ohio, clearly you have 30 days early voting. In Indiana, you get a voter ID card that's paid for by the government. I've been pushing for that in Ohio as well. We can do all of these things and get good and voter integrity without having the federal government overreach and trying to take over the system. Some of the things they're trying to do in HR1 is unbelievable. I mean, same day registration, online registration. We're already having problems with these kind of registrations. Why would we take it even further? So in the end, I agree with you. There are some good Democrat states and good Republican states already doing good things with voter integrity. Instead of having the federal government overreach, let's start looking at the states that are doing a good job. Let's keep it in the state's hands, but let's make sure that they're doing what's necessary to make sure all legal votes are counted. And I think then we will have a great system and it shouldn't be about popular votes. I mean, look, you're always going to have, you know, popular votes one way or the other. That's why our forefathers put an electoral college in place so that every state had the opportunity to have their say as well. Mm. Thank you, panel, for weighing in on some tough topics today. It was a great conversation, as it always is. Everyone else, stay tuned, because coming up after the break, there's a tiger on the loose in Houston, Texas. We have the video up next on America's Voice Live. <laughs>